Yes, Dr. Varner asked me to come here tonight and talk about the material culture of the Whiskey Rebellion. And since I've been doing uh, 18th century reenacting for over 20 years now, I felt qualified to do that. But then I felt less qualified to talk about the Whiskey Rebellion, something for which I'm not an expert at, at all. So I needed to go and find something out about it and perhaps you could benefit from, let's see. It would work if it was the Revolutionary War. <laughs> oh, let's see. Might just be you'll have to hit the space bar, Todd. Hey. Hey. That, that works anyway. <laughs> So it's the 1790s, and there are some problems in our country. We have a revolutionary, revolutionary war debt that needs to be repaid. Uh, bonds had been paying for a lot of the war, and of course bondholders want to be repaid at some time. Soldiers were often mustered out without getting paid, but being given government bonds which did them absolutely no good because they needed cash. They had families to take care of, they wanted to buy land and so on, or if they had been given land in payment, they need to move out to it. So they end up selling these bonds to speculators for pennies on the dollar because they want something right away. And we also have a problem going on is out in the Western country, we're talking the Pittsburgh region out there, a lot of that land is being owned by people in the East who bought it on speculation, but there are families living on it in the West uh, who are from time to time being thrown off from the land by the sheriffs and their houses burnt down. So we, we have a lot of unsettled feeling going on in the country at this time, particularly in Western Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Virginia. <laughs> now let's see what happens. Okay. So, how are we going to repay this debt? Let's have a tax. Yes. Um, it, as I recall, it was the tax thing that got us. Yes. Um, so, but we need to repay these bonds. I mean, the government has an obligation. If the government can't repay, they can't get more credit. So, do we have import taxes on things coming into the country or excise taxes on things that we produce within the country? Up until this point, it had only been import taxes. And everyone seemed to be okay with that. But then, um, in 1791, the Secretary of the Treasurer Treasury, Alexander Hamilton said, let's put a tax on spirits, whiskey, uh, alcohol being produced within the country. Well, that's a major change, and people were a little unsettled about it. Um, and it's going to cause some problems. Now, the wealthy merchants in the East had to pay these import taxes but they didn't have to pay taxes on producing whiskey because they weren't whiskey producers. But they were also these bondholders from the revolution who want to see the money coming in. And if not enough is coming in through taxing imports, let's tax things going on here. The commoners, us, we didn't have those bonds because even if we did, we sold them at a discount trying to get some cash. But they're the consumers of the whiskey. They're the people who are going to be paying that tax eventually to support the rich merchants in the East. Can anyone see where this might be a problem coming up? <laughs> so how much was the tax? And now this gets interesting, I found. Nine cents per gallon of spirits. Well, I think we still have a tax on whiskey, and I bet it's more than nine cents a gallon. But. In the 
urban areas where revenue collectors could go and measure output, they were being taxed by how many gallons that they were producing. So a still in Philadelphia, if it's producing 500 gallons a year, they get charged $500 time, or 500 gallons times nine cents, and they get a discount. They get a discount of two cents off from every 10 gallons produced. If you're out around Pittsburgh, everyone has a still. Well, a lot of people have stills. And there's a, a reason for it that we will get into. But because the revenue collectors can't go from still to still all the time, instead of, instead of charging according to what you actually produce, they calculate how much could you produce if your still was running full time at maximum capacity. <laughs> Yeah, um, these are professional brewers. They're not running them year round. They're not running on, on actual capacity. So they're getting paid the maximum amount possible and no rebate. The big distillers are being charged only according to what they produce and getting a rebate. Can anyone see a problem with this? <laughs> Now, interestingly enough, the big distillers supported this tax. Any idea why? It's put the competition on business. Bingo. Yeah. So, uh, we have people, uh, at this time, it's still Cumberland County out at Pittsburgh. People in Cumberland County have been noted for being rioters in the past. <laughs> and it's going to be no different now after the revolution than it was before. So, why, why are they producing all this, this whiskey out west anyway? And it has to do with logistics. You have all this corn, rye, grain that you need to move to a market over the Appalachian Mountains. Well, if you have 24 bushels of rye, it takes three pack animals to carry it. And you can sell it for $6 a net loss after you pay for the transportation. But if you take that same 24 bushels and you convert it into whiskey, it comes down to two eight-gallon kegs, requires one animal, and you can sell it for $16 once it gets over the mountain. You can actually make money this way. So that's what the farmers are doing. They're, they're producing for their own use, and a surplus for the market, but you can't sell grain to each other, so you have to sell it to the cities in the east. But you can't do that prof profitably, unless you convert it into something more profitable, such as whiskey. Now the next problem is the tax had to be paid in coin, annually. Once a year, the revenue shows up figures out that you can make a million gallons of whiskey out of your still over the course of the year, and you need to pay with silver and gold coin right now, and there isn't any. So it's causing some problems. If you didn't register your still, you could be fined. And if you did register your still, you know what happened then? Your neighbors burned down your barn because you sided over with the revenuers by registering. <laughs> and of course, at this time, if, if your barn burns down in the fall, there's nothing for all winter. Your family's gonna starve or have to move out. So it creates serious problems. So there's going to be some military action because there, there is rioting, the Tax collectors are being tarred and feathered, which sounds a little ridiculous, <coughs> but what it involves at this time is stripping the clothes off from a person, taking the tar, which is boiled pine pitch, and to be applied it has to be hot, putting scalding hot pine pitch on their skin and rolling them around in chicken feathers from their poultry. Uh, 
That in itself can be fatal, and even if it's not fatal, it is very, very painful and very difficult to remove. So, we have agents of the government being assaulted, we have people refusing to pay the tax, we have people attacking their neighbors who try to cooperate. We have to restore order somehow. So, the president, Washington at this time, takes a look at the Constitution and says, the President of the United States is Commander-in-Chief of the military. So he gets on his horse to lead troops in the battle once again. Uh, it's not quite seen the same way. Uh, during the War of 1812, President Madison actually led troops, but in the Battle of Bladensburg because they were attacking Washington, D.C. He didn't lead any place else. But he calls up 13,000 militia. Now, we don't have a standing army at this time. We have a very small standing army. We didn't like the thought of standing armies because the British had one on our shores. So he calls up the, the militia. That is able-bodied men from 16 to 45 years old at this time. And he's calling them up from four different states. So by calling up locals, Pennsylvanians, and people near Pennsylvania, it reduces the chance of violence because are you going to shoot at your neighbors? Are they going to shoot back at you? Well, in the 7th or 1860s, we're going to have a problem with that one. But it's a good strategy at this time. So, in October of 1794, Washington comes to Carlisle, where 10,000 militiamen from New Jersey and Pennsylvania has gathered. Now, there's a road that goes from Carlisle to Fort Pitt. It was created by General Forbes and his troops back in 1758. So he has a way of getting out there. He's also going to have troops, uh, another 3,000 from Virginia and Maryland, read, led by the Virginia governor. They're going to meet up Fort Cumberland. During the French and Indian War, Braddock builds a road from Fort Cumberland. Well, he stopped about seven miles from Fort Pitt and got killed. But they finished the road eventually. So there are two roads that can converge at the hub of where this problem is going on. So they are going to move out in, in that fall and occupy that area, mostly without violence. Uh, there are a few uh, shootings that were accidental because you, you have 13,000 people who'd rather be somewhere else carrying guns because of people who aren't following the law and paying the tax that they themselves had to pay. So it creates some animosity. So because of that, um, they're going to stay for several weeks, but as a result, things will settle down. So the outcome, well, the tax remains in force. Uh, the ringleaders of it will flee to the west, to the Ohio country, just to avoid being arrested. People were offered amnesty if they pledged that they would obey the law and be good citizens. And they actually had to come in and sign oaths according to that. And they had to pay their taxes. Uh, most people did. Some people didn't. They fled. But order was returned. Did the tax stay forever? No. Uh, but it was going to stay for several years, if not till uh, Thomas Jefferson becomes president, that the tax is finally going to be repealed. So that's why this whole thing is going on. And then that leads me into, let's look at some of the stuff that they might have used. And you've had a chance to come up and look, and I'll give a more formal explanation. There's going to be a variety of guns in use at the time, uh, because although the uh, government had arms they could issue the militia, militiamen were supposed to report work with a working gun 
Did your family own one gun, though? Are you going to take that and leave them defenseless? In a lot of cases, no. But many people brought their own. So it's going to be a combination of old military guns, either issued by the government or things that you might have carried in the Revolution, because we're only talking a dozen years earlier for the American Revolution. Uh, so it could be British guns, it could be French guns, it could be Dutch guns. Those are all things that were coming in during the Revolution. It might be a civilian gun. Uh, we call it a shotgun today. They called it a fowler, something for shooting up fowl birds, um, rabbits, squirrels, that type of thing. Or it could be a rifle barrel gun. Uh, rifle barrel guns were much more accurate, although they're slower to load. So let's take a look at some of them. A, a word about safety. Uh, this is just a plug to keep dirt out of the barrel. Uh, whenever we handle a gun, we always make sure that it is unloaded. And in the case of a muzzle loader, you do that by inserting the ramrod into the barrel and seeing if it goes all the way down. And since this is my gun, I know that's how far it's supposed to be. So there's nothing in the barrel. So this particular gun is a British second model long land pattern musket. Uh, today we call it the Brown Bess. That term doesn't seem to be used until the early 19th century. They would have just called it the uh, long land pattern. But the way a flintlock works is you have a lock mechanism, you have a piece of flint, and you have a piece of steel here. And when flint hits steel, you get sparks. So there will be some priming powder that will go in this little pan here. And right next to the pan, there's a little hole drilled through the barrel. It's called the vent. So when the gun's loaded, sparks here set off the charge in the pan. It flashes, some of that flash goes through the hole, and that little stream of fire sets off the main gunpowder charge, and bang, it goes off. The safety mechanism of the time is this. It's called a hammer cap or a hammer stall. It's a piece of leather, because when flint hits leather, you don't get sparks. The geometry of the British musket is such that the wrist will crack fairly easily. And that, in fact, happened with this one. I looked at one in the Smithsonian that was repaired. It had a piece of sheet brass wrapped around the wrist and nailed on, so I copied that. Others will have wire round, wound around it in order to repair it. So let me tell you something about uh, loading and firing the gun. This is the musket ball that this gun particular fires. It is 69 caliber, meaning it's 69 one hundredths of an inch in diameter. The barrel itself is 75 caliber, 75 one hundredths of an inch. The reason for the difference is I can load faster if there's less resistance, which there will certainly be after I take a few shots and the barrel starts to get dirty. They generally load from a cartridge. It looks like this, and this has a cutaway to it. You can see that there is a musket ball inside and gunpowder inside. If we roll these cartridges before the battle, we have a measured amount of gunpowder in there, which is the correct amount, and it's the armorer's job whenever he opens a new barrel of gunpowder to test it to see how strong it is, and then he tells you how many grains of gunpowder you'll use for the cartridge. Some powder is higher quality than others, so it can vary. But you would carry a cartridge box and a rig where you have a cartridge box, a belt, a bayonet, a musket, and a sling is called a stand of arms. And if you look in the archives, an inventory say something about we have 150 stand of arms. In Your gun's fallen. You know, it has fallen lots of times. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So all these together make a complete set for the military. Sometimes as well you would have a uh, cartridge pouch, which would be one that you could wear over the shoulder, and that way it's easy to reach in, pull out one of the cartridges, and start the loading process. And I'll show you what the loading process is. I have no gunpowder with me tonight. I will not make any explosions. The, the school kids always want to see me make explosions too, but schools are kind of funny about that. <laughs> so, uh, the sergeant would give the command of cast about. You'd move the gun like this. Handle cartridge. You'd take the cartridge out of your box, tear it open with your teeth or your fingers. You pour the gunpowder down the barrel, then you push the paper and the ball into the barrel. Take the ramrod out and ram it all down to the bottom. Now on a well-worn gun, that vent hole will have opened up enough that some of the gunpowder will spill out into the pan. On a newer quality gun, you'll have to pour some from the cartridge into the pan before you put it down the barrel. So when you have the gunpowder in here, this cover, you've ran down the cartridge, you would put it up to your shoulder so that your sergeant knows that you're ready. He would tell you to make ready. You'd pull the cock to full cock, you would take off this leather cap that acts as your safety, he would tell you to aim, and then he'd tell you to fire. Now I'm going to pull the trigger, and with luck you'll see sparks coming off from it, but there'll be no explosion, so fire. And you may have seen a few sparks there. Uh, some of the questions I get asked about it is, how often does it not work? And, and it varies. I have done reenactments where I have fired 28 shots in a light rain with no misfires. Other times I pulled the trigger, the flint broke, and that was that. <laughs> My guess is for trained soldiers who properly maintain their weapons, in 20 shots they might get a misfire, and that may require them to do uh, things like reprime, or sometimes you'll get a lot of buildup of, uh, of gunk, essentially. Burnt gunpowder that's absorbing moisture from the air and makes it kind of a sludge. So, on the cartridge box here we have a whisk and pick. The pick is basically just a metal needle that I can reach in, open that hole, Take the brush, brush the gunk out, and then I can pour a little more gunpowder in there and try again. And often it will work on the second try. I also get asked about how about the accuracy? <coughs> because this is a smooth bore and you're using a smaller uh, ball rather than a tightly patched ball, there's going to be some wobble as it goes down the barrel. You could reliably hit someone out to about 50 yards. If you tightly patch the ball, which would make it much slower to load, you could extend that out to about 75 yards reliably, and beyond that, if you hit someone at 100 yards, it's not necessarily who you were aiming at. <laughs> but there's a couple of factors here. One, you're not just shooting up by yourself, you have 100 of your best friends standing shoulder to shoulder with you. And if you wonder about, when you watch the movies, why are they out there in a big line? Can't everyone see them and shoot? Well, there's a couple of answers to that. Uh, one, 
there's usually not a bunch of conveniently placed rocks and trees for you to hide behind. <laughs> Particularly if you're attacking something like a fort, where they cut down all the trees all around it so that you can't sneak up on it. The next factor that comes in is these produce a lot of smoke. So if you have hundreds of people firing all at once, and you have cannons going off all at once, your enemy can be wearing bright red like they did in the revolution, and they can be 50 yards away and you can't even see them. And I, I had a chance to experience that once. Uh, 10 years ago, we were doing a reenactment of the uh, Battle of Fort Ticonderoga in 1758. And a lot of reenactors were out, and they had the French lines, and they had warning stakes in the ground 20 yards before the French line so that we didn't get so close it was dangerous. There was so much smoke on the field that not only did we not see the warning stakes, but our officer marched us into the wall. <laughs> you just couldn't see there was so much smoke. So when you take that into effect, if you have a lot of smoke, you can't pick out individual targets. Accuracy is not as important. What is going to be important is speed. How much can you fire? Which brings up the question is, how quickly can a trained soldier do all these steps? And a the answer is a trained soldier can fire three to four shots a minute. So 15 to 20 seconds to go through all the steps that I showed you. Now you may wonder, can people really do that? As an example, my reenacting group did a test, and we had six by six inch blocks of wood. We put four blocks of wood on a rail 25 yards away, and a buddy of mine who is an engineer, and he's a little prosperous, so you know he's not a fit soldier, in 58 seconds he fired four times and hit three of the blocks. So it can be done. And if you think, uh, Traditionally, in battles in the 18th century, you're only fighting three or four days a year because spaces are big and transport is small. What does a sergeant do with a bunch of people who have nothing to do all day? Drill. Drill, yes, because if you don't drill, they will find something to do and you will not be happy about it. <laughs> so they're going to drill them over and over. Uh, another thing that you can do to increase your effectiveness is the bayonet. Uh, the bayonet makes this a weapon even when it is not loaded because you can now attack the enemy with a sharp pointy object. So the strategy, and during the Whiskey Rebellion they didn't have to resort to the strategy because they were able to intimidate people into not fighting them. But the strategy would be to load, fire, advance, load, fire, advance. And when you reach the point where you think that your men can run to where their men are in less than 20 seconds, as soon as the enemy fires, you charge. Suddenly, out of the smoke comes 100 guys with sharp pointy things on their end of the guns. And if you don't have a bayonet on already, there's not time. There's not time to load. You've got three choices. You can run away, you can surrender, or you can get stabbed. We know from the medical record, not many people are getting stabbed. We're not getting that many prisoners taken. Run away is the, the best choice. And, and if it's your goal to get the enemy away from your home, run away is good enough. If, if someone else has to fight him tomorrow, that's not your problem. Now, if you'll notice, it, these, this bayonet does not look like a sword or a knife like we think of today. And you, you will hear a number of stories about why that is, but I'll tell you the, the real reason. Uh, one, iron is cheap at this time and steel is expensive. The only steel parts of that gun are the springs, and the face where the flint strikes. All the rest is iron, including the bayonet. Iron doesn't hold a good edge like steel does, so making this like a knife is not going to be a big advantage. 
making it pointed like a spear, the point will stay sharp enough so that you can thrust in. But if you have a flat blade, it'll bend. And some of the Dutch bayonets were in fact flat, and the archaeologists find them bent. But if you make a ridge on it, it becomes more rigid, less likely to bend. It's also easier for the blacksmith forging it to make a triangular shape, turning it and striking it. And then to make the metal go farther in terms of how many bayonets can you make with 100 pounds of iron, if we hollow them a little bit on the edges, you save a little bit of metal on each one and it makes it lighter to carry. So you have something that, because of the technology of the time, you're going to make it triangular to keep it from bending. You're going to put grooves in it to lighten it, and you're going to have it pointed because it's not going to be able to hold a good edge. You will hear other stories about why this is, and I will not repeat them. Let, lest you get that into your mind. But when you hear someone say a story, you go, I heard a guy talk at once about how these were made out of iron and they had to make them differently than we make them today. And you'll impress your friends that way. So with the stand of arms, you get the bayonet, you get the scabbard, you get a belt, you get a cartridge box to wear on your waist. Often the soldiers had them that they could throw over their shoulders. This is a, a homemade one that a militia man might have rather than a government procured one. One other thing that you would have is this little tool here to take care of your musket. It has two sizes of screwdrivers, they call them turn screws, to tighten and loosen things on here. And we also have this part here called a worm that if I remove the ramrod from this, you'll see on this end it's threaded. I can screw this onto it, and then I can take a piece of wet cloth or leaves or something and clean out the barrel. And people say, well, why is it attached to the screwdriver? I always reply to, if I gave this to a 17-year-old soldier and say, don't lose it, what's going to happen next? <laughs> yes. So if we attach it to another larger tool, maybe there's a chance that he'll keep it. Of course, archaeologists find the whole set occasionally, so it doesn't always work. Taking a look at another gun, You'll notice this looks amazingly like the last one I showed you, only it's smaller. This is the carbine version of what I just showed you. And it is 69 caliber, so it's smaller and fires a 65 caliber ball. In all other respects though, it's the same weapon that I just showed you. It's a, a flintlock musket produced by the English and would have been found throughout the colonies simply because there were things left over from the war. Now this is the one that some people have looked at, a fowler, and this particular styling was made for the Indian trade. It resembles French guns. Uh, a lot of the Indians were trading with the French so the English started making them with the same graceful lines of it. But this was a relatively inexpensive gun, so you could expect a militiaman to have it as well. It would be used to fire uh, primarily small pieces of, of lead. We call it birdshot today or buckshot. You can also put a lead ball in it if you're going to be hunting something larger like a deer or a bear. The size of it is 20 gauge, and shotguns are measured in gauges, and you always wonder, where did that come from? 
Well, if you were to take a pound of lead and make a number of balls that fit this size barrel, you would get 20 of them. And that's where 20 gauge comes from. 12 gauge, you get 12 round balls for a pound of lead. Uh, with that comes out to, in comparison to these, it's 62 caliber, 62 100 to me. So a little bit smaller than either of these. It is a lighter weight gun, easier to carry. It's also not as robust. Um, this one has not broken here, but if you were to handle it roughly, it's thinner, it could break. Also, there's no feature for a bayonet on this. Uh, Militiamen were required to report either with a gun with a bayonet or if they didn't have a bayonet, a sword. How many of you have a sword at home? Okay, <laughs> one, good. <laughs> or if you didn't have that, report with a uh, hatchet or axe. Most people reported with this because, of course, this is actually useful. So a militiaman would have reported with a gun like this in many of the cases. And he's probably not going to have a cartridge box, although he might. Often he has his hunting bag. And in the 18th century, hunting bags were smaller than we envision them today. They're about the size of your hand. And that's because you only have to carry a few things in them. Uh, you need to carry some shot, either round ball or bird shot. But since this was made for hunting, you're probably not going to go out and shoot 20 deer. So, you know, half a dozen musket balls is all you need, or a few ounces of bird shot. You would have a powder measure, and you would carry your gunpowder in a cow's horn. And for those of you who don't know, cow's horns are actually naturally hollow, except for the last couple inches of the tip. So you can clean it up, drill a hole in one end, put a plug in the other end, and you have something that's waterproof and sparkproof to put your gunpowder in. But you don't really want to just pour the gunpowder down the barrel for a couple of reasons. One, you don't know how much you put in, and two, if it's not your first shot, there might be a little glowing ember in here, and now you've got a grenade in your hand. So instead, you pour it into a powder measure, and this one happens to be adjustable. So if I'm hunting squirrels, just a little bit of powder. If I'm hunting bears, a lot of powder. Or some people poured it into their hand knowing about how much is right because they've done it all their life and then just dump it in. You're also going to have tools in here. Here is a worm that fits on a wooden ramrod. And now an archaeologist can find it. <laughs> but it's, it's just a tapered spring that you can put on the end, and now you can wrap cloth on it and clean out the barrel. Other things that you might have would be, oh, a spare flint, in case your flint breaks, and a screwdriver, so you can adjust. There's another worm, and a little copper funnel for filling your powder horn. Horns only have one opening, and if you're going to fill it, it's easier with a horn. Does anyone know why it's copper? Spark. Exactly. Copper doesn't spark. So, it's nice to keep sparks away from your gunpowder. Which is also why it's important after every load to put the cap back. Because otherwise a spark can fly 
out of your priming pan right into here, and again, you have a grenade under your arm. It doesn't seem to be fatal, however, because from time to time in the reenacting community, it actually happens. And if you're wearing your heavy wool regimental coat, you go to the hospital and have pieces of horn pulled out of your arm and your ribs, but it's not a serious injury because we know about germs. Unfortunately, they did not know about germs, and that's going to kill more people than, than bullets and cannonballs and such. And then we have the next type of arm here, a rifle barrel gun. And we're going to check to make sure that it is not loaded. And this belongs to a buddy of mine. And I'm going to assume if it went down that far that there's nothing in it. So. People often ask when I'm at the Smithsonian, when did rifles come along? And the answer is about the year 1500. The, the Germans figured out fairly early that if you can make the musket ball spin, like we spin a football when we throw it, it goes straighter. So they will cut grooves into the barrel. And while a modern military gun will have a complete revolution of the bullet in 10 to 12 inches, in these guns, it's like 30 to 40 inches. It's a very slow turning of it. This gun has a smaller bullet size than any of the others. It's 50 caliber. The, the bullet's half an inch in diameter, and it's pretty much half an inch in diameter. You would take a piece of greased cloth, put it over the end of the muzzle, push a mus the musket ball in with your thumb, and then use the ramrod to ram it down. Because it has to fit tightly in order to spin, it's harder to ram. So we have a military gun with a pre-made cartridge, 15 seconds to load. We have a civilian gun with a powder horn, about 30 seconds to load. And now when we have this one, it's about 45 seconds to load. Now I have read accounts of people loading them much quicker in emergencies, which involved Dumping gunpowder from the horn, dangerous, don't try this at home. Keeping balls in their mouth and spitting them into the barrel as they run. No patch, so there's no resistance. Striking it on the ground to have inertia drop the ball down here. And with a large enough vent hole, some of the gunpowder will come out into the pan and then they would swing around, fire, and continue to run. As you might guess, there's a lot of danger to that. <laughs> if the ball only goes halfway down and you fire it, the barrel will probably <coughs> explode. But then if I'm being pursued by the enemy and trying to get away, then maybe I'll take that chance. And of course, we only read the accounts of where it worked. I'm not sure about <laughs> the accounts where it did not work. Some of the other things a soldier would carry is a canteen. And I will note that canteens are a military item in the 18th century. It's not like today when we all walk around with a water bottle. Um, they're made out of wood or they're made out of tin-plated sheet iron. And because militia are not regular military, a lot of them did not have canteens, which becomes a problem on a long march. But when you live in a society where everyone works at home and they've got a well or a stream, uh, the thought of having a canteen is a little different. He also has a bag called a haversack that is essentially a lunch bag. They will have their rations in here. I also have some eating utensils. I have a tin plate and a tin cup, a wooden bowl. I have a spoon made out of horn. Some people would have them made out of wood or made out of pewter. Uh, and I have a piece of ship's biscuit. Uh, in the Civil War, we'll call this hard pack. But this is primarily being used by sailors who can't 
cook fresh bread on wooden ships that tend to burn if you start fires. So these were made up. This is a, a quarter pound of flour. There's a little salt. You mix it into a dough and you bake it until it is hard. And it is very hard. And don't put this in your mouth because it is my demo piece. <laughs> you don't know where it's been before you. But they would be issued a pound of bread a day, so four of these, or fresh bread, if you're in a camp, uh, a pound of meat a day, and then beans or rice or peas, according to what can be found. Uh, fresh vegetables, not quite as often. A group of half a dozen or so men would be called a mess, and a mess would get a tent to, to sleep in, and axe to cut firewood, and a kettle to cook in. Uh, this is a military kettle. It's made out of, uh, again, tin sheet iron. Did they have cast iron pots? They sure did. Did anyone <coughs> want to carry them? No. I've read accounts of people who did carry them, and they never seemed to make it to the end of the march. This is lightweight, though. And the reason it's so large is when I said, you get a pound of meat a day, I'm not going to give you a pound of meat and you a pound of meat. Your whole mess is going to get it. And it's not a pound of meat because there's bone in there and everything else. So they, they chop off, oh, they might chop off 12 pounds of, and give it to you to cover two days. So you're going to want to boil it all up. Uh, not that they know about germs, but they understand about getting sick. But whatever's causing it, raw food seems to be involved somewhere. So they would boil things up. Often they would make a bag to carry it in so you don't get soot all over your clothes. Some people may have bought a civilian kettle with them as well. A variety of things would have been issued. And we have the soldier's pack. It's just a bag with straps on it. What are some of the things you might think a soldier would be carrying? Dice. Dice, yes. Not that I'm going to tell the sergeant about it or show you. How about extra stockings? Uh, the commonest colors of stockings in the 18th century were white, the color of sheep, not bright white, uh, blue if they're dyed, or brown because there are brown sheep, and walnut holes make a nice dye. A shoehorn made out of horn, hence the name. Needle and thread? Needle and thread? Yes, we do. It's not in my hand right now, but it will be in a moment because we also have a clean shirt. Pull a toothbrush out. <laughs> well, I have this little personal bag here, and we'll see what we get out of it. We have a soap holder. We have a brush so I can lather up my face. Uh, beards were not fashionable at the time, yet men weren't exactly clean shaven. Someone who was rich, a wealthy uh, plantation owner, a wealthy merchant, someone who has to you know, show that he's higher class, He'll probably be shaving every day. Uh, for a commoner, he probably shaves on Saturday so he looks nice for church on Sunday. So stubble would be common, a uh, groomed beard like yours would be uncommon. Not that it wasn't there. But here's a straight razor like they used in the 18th century, and if nothing convinced me to have a beard, it would be this. <laughs> um, yeah. Because they're shaving without mirrors. Right? Well, some people have mirrors, and in fact, I do carry a mirror, not a real big mirror. Uh, often, you're being shaved by someone else. Uh, in the British military system, they had a regimental barber sur surgeon whose job was shaving everybody. And as you might imagine, he can't shave everyone every day, so stubble would be common. And I, I heard a question about a toothbrush. We have a nice bone-handled 
hog bristle brush here. Did everyone brush? No, I don't think everyone brushes today either. But some people do, and we find them archaeologically. We also have a little sewing kit with your needles and threads and pins and a pocket that I have uh, thread in. Uh, a pipe. This one's made out of tin as opposed to clay. They had metal pipes. The clay ones, I think, were more common. And of course, we'd have tobacco as well. Kids don't try this at home. And we also have a fire making kit here, where we have a flint. This is a worn out gun flint. We have a steel striker. We make sparks, we catch the sparks in tinder, we just get a flame, they don't let me do this in here. <laughs> some people are so funny. Yeah, some people are funny about that. A, a, a spare handkerchief. We have a blanket. Um, these are reproductions of 18th century blankets, uh, but this is a locally woven blanket. Um, not local as in Cumberland County, but a home industry would have done this in two fairly narrow panels that if you open it up, you can see where there's a seam where they have sewn them together. You can see the stripes don't exactly match up. And then the other thing that people don't think about when they think about the military is road maintenance. Uh, this road is 40 years old by the time that they're using it and there's going to be ruts and holes and rocks exposed. So a good bit of the marsh is going to be consumed with making the road a better place. And then we have one treat here that belongs to the historical society. This is a horn that was actually used at Fort Pitt in the 18th or 1760s. And you can come up and you can read it and see the date of it. So this is a sampling of what the soldiers would have had, what they would have done. Oh, let's see if we can get this to work. And of course not. So if you want to learn more about the 18th century history, you're in luck because this very week, Fort Frederick is having its 18th century market fair. And I have cards in the back of the room. It's about an hour and a quarter from Carlisle. You go down 81 to 70, west on 70 to exit 12, and there's a big friendly sign that says Fort Frederick. And you turn there. So it's going to be open to the public Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Only $5 to get in. And yes, I've been a volunteer at Fort Frederick for 19 years now, so longer than I've been here. Uh, they'll have over 140 vendors. They will have hundreds of reenactors. And we have a question. Yes? Well, finish with what you have there. It's really cool, and you get to see me wear three or four different outfits <laughs> over the course of, of the week. Yes? You did introduce us to the sergeant's toothpick there. Oh, oh, yes. Uh, this is referred to as a pole weapon. Uh, they come in two flavors. An officer's spontoon looks like a spear, and a sergeant's halberd looks like a spear with an ax on it. Oh. In the Middle Ages, it was probably a real weapon. By this time, it's more ceremonial. You go, Captain's over there. I can see his spontoon and know where he is. Also, when you're trying to line these soldiers up into a straight line, you now have a straight edge. Uh, if cavalry is coming, you do have a way of repulsing it as well. Doesn't work real well with people coming at you with bayonets, but horses do not like charging into spears. So yes, thank you for pointing that out. It's I, also good for uh, prodding reluctant soldiers in your line. Yes, that too. I will entertain all kinds of questions and answer half of them. Yes. So in modern manual of arms, we have fairly standard safety uh, guides about not touching the 
trigger and watch where you're putting yes. your muzzle. Was there an equivalent uh, in 17 or even, uh, I'm sorry, 18 to the 19th century? I mean, when did that first come in about the standard package of safety rules? Uh, after the 18th century, I can say for certain. Yeah. <coughs> And that's because you read about a lot of accidents in terms of people accidentally shooting themselves or others, people falling on their tomahawk because few people had leather covers over them, that they weren't as safety conscious. Uh, the safety features that they do have, and there are a few, is one, this gun is at half cock right now. If you pull the trigger, it doesn't go. If you have a broken gun, it can go off half cock. You have to pull it to full cock in order to make it fire. And if it should fire accidentally, this leather cap prevents a spark. That's a pretty short list of safety features, isn't it? <laughs> so common sense comes into play. Yeah, uh -oh. Well, you know, if, if you live this as your life, it seems more normal. Seems like you've touched on a couple of sites going off half cock and a flash of the pan. Exactly. And of course, the three parts of the gun are the lock, the stock, and the barrel. That makes a complete gun. So yes, there, there are sayings that come out of this time period. Oh. When I do programs for children and I ask about, you know, did they carry any books? And they'll, they'll guess. And uh, the book that I have with me here is the Book of Common Prayer. If any of you are Anglicans, you, you use one that's probably still very similar to this. Often the kids will say they had a Bible. And of course, the Bible was the most common book in the colonies but they didn't have onion skin paper yet. So I'm guessing very few soldiers carried this with them. Probably many of them carried a, a religious prayer book of some denomination, but Bibles, not so much in the field. Other questions? Yes? Uh, in, in the tactics, uh, did they do volley fire in, in two ranks? Two ranks or three ranks sometimes. However, during this operation, they never needed to do it. You get 13,000 armed men come to your city and say, behave, and people who behave or leave. But that, those were, I, I assume, part of the drill also. Yes, and yes it was. Movements left and right. So you have one person down on a knee, another person standing behind him, and the third person resting on the shoulder of the second person. And then you can have three fight. Or you can line up, say, four abreast in a long column. The front row fires. They peel off to go to the back, loading as they run. And the column moves forward. So it's bang, 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 a continuous fire. But it had to be very scary. You know, in, in, in my war, it was streaks of light coming across the sky and something exploding over there. I imagine it's very different when it's things whizzing by your head and your friend falling over. So I think they were very brave men. And I don't know so much about the Whiskey Rebellion, because I, I wasn't able to figure it out. But it was normal at the time to include women with the army. Uh, the typical amount would be four women per company of 100 men. And they'd be going along as laundresses and as nurses. And they'd be in the pay of the army. And they may or may not be married to a soldier. But they were part of the army. Any other questions? Yes? If there like was a forest and there's trees around, mm -hmm. would they hide behind them if they could? They, they could, but here's the deal. Say if you're attacking a fort, you can't attack a fort with a dozen guys. You have to attack with a thousand guys. And are there a thousand trees? No. If you're fighting the Indians and there's a dozen of them and a dozen of you, yes, rocks and trees are great. But wars aren't won 
with squads moving around in the woods, they're one with armies bearing down on the enemy. So even though we think it's odd that they would stand out there in the open and fire like that, with the technology of the time, it makes sense. Now let's fast forward 50 or 60 years. Uh, in 1840, there'll be a Frenchman by the name of Captain Mini who's going to invent a pointed bullet with a hollow back. Now he can have a bullet that's smaller than the rifling that drops in easier, but when the gunpowder explodes, the thin back expands and grabs the rifling grooves. Now you're loading an accurate gun as fast as the inaccurate gun, and we entered the Civil War with old tactics and new weapons, and thousands of people get killed. And it will take them a while before they match up the tactics with the technology. Any other questions? In the Whiskey Rebellion, all these 13,000 or whatever, they're all infantry? Any cavalry there were some cavalry, yes. Oh. I didn't. I didn't find numbers of which, but each of the states had sent cavalry in addition to infantry. Well, I have talked for an hour now. You're welcome to come up and take another look at things now that you've had an explanation of some of them. You can ask further questions, and, and then you can come see me at Fort Frederick, <laughs> where I'll be every day this week and was this morning as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.